Kitchen. Welcome to another season of Backyard Farmer. We're celebrating 70 years of answering your gardening questions. We can't wait to get started on another year of good gardening. If you'd like to ask a question, just dial 1-800-676-5446. Our phone panel will be happy to help you out. You can also contact us via email with your questions and your pictures. That address is byf at unl.edu. Please tell us where you live. Give us as much information as you can so we can do a good job answering your questions. Don't forget to follow us during the week on our social media pages, YouTube, Facebook, all that social media stuff. So, Jody, what is it? It's my prop for tonight because I don't have any live insects because it's pretty cold out there. It is. Um, so I've been getting a lot of questions uh, about when should I clean up my garden? And this is a really good question because these people are, are interested in keeping the beneficial insects around, particularly the pollinators. So the solitary bees that are either in nesting tunnels, such as stems or a bee hotel that you may have. So you may have something that looks like this in your yard, just a bunch of stems, or you may have some dead foliage. And we're telling people to keep that there right now if that's what you're doing to protect the solitary bees. You wanna wait till temperatures are above 50 degrees consistently, so that maybe the high is about 55 degrees. So that way they'll be ready to come out. Sometimes it doesn't look very nice like this, but don't worry because when the plants bloom again, it will cover all that up and that will be <laughs> habitat for your bees. And it's just lovely, but that's really not what they look like. When they fly I don't even know what these plants are, but so hopefully that answers the questions. I know just be patient. The temperature here or the weather is just so unpredictable that um, I'm sure we'll hear from, from the others, but so just hold off on cleaning up that garden. All right, thanks, Jody. Okay, Rock, your sample is nothing that looks turf-like, but it's really important, right? No, it is, and right now, and Jody mentioned it as well, we've had a really strange winter, and we're gonna see some things going on, and we're having people saying, well, my lawn's not really greening up 100%, or the infamous, is it time to put on the pre-emergent right now? And really, the best way to do that is with a soil thermometer, not ambient temperatures, although the daytime temperatures or the temp ambient temperatures do need to be el relatively elevated, but just one of these cooking thermometers, I prefer the digital one, I'm gonna put the analog one down because it just isn't very accurate, but one that you can stick into the ground two to four inches, get that soil temperature and wrap your arms around whether or not it's warm enough yet for the turf to be greening up. And we know that you know soil temperatures in the, in the 50 to 65 range are optimal, a little bit below that, and as we ramp up to that temperature, the, the lawn starts to green up. Well, when if, if I went out in my in your yard right now, I'd be hard pressed to find a soil temperature above about, above about 42 or 43 degrees, right? So this thermometer is going to go a long way in helping with that. Then when we add that to the fact that we're going to be doing pre-emergent herbicides sometime in the near future, but not tomorrow, and not the day after that, or not the week after that, because their projection is for some cooler weather. So don't be anxious to put that pre-emergent down. The longer you delay that, the longer season long you control you get, and you might even get by with only a single application under Nebraska conditions. So let's keep an eye on those soil temperatures. For crabgrass, you want it to be at about the 50 to 55 range for multiple days in a row, and then you're ready for your pre. Don't let the calendar day, and certainly don't use the forsythia blooming, because we had forsythia blooming last last year in November because of the weird That's weather right. we've been having. So let's not use those mm -hmm. phenological indicators. <laughs> so soil thermometers are really easy. These are not actually soil thermometers, they're cooking thermometers, and I'm certainly, you can you know rummage around, you'll probably find a thermometer anywhere in your, in your cooking shelf or go out and buy one, they're not very expensive. But let's use those rather than, hey, I think it's time kind of routine. All right, excellent. Kyle, you are, you've outdone yourself on something that's it's, really ugly. It's, they're beautiful, Kim. It's <laughs> beauty is in the, in the eye of the beholder anyway, right? <laughs> so I've been getting a lot of questions about these brown baseball hard things that are showing up in people's yards. And these are all over my yard as well. These are scleroderma earth balls, or more commonly known as the devil's snuff box. Um, so it's a pretty fun name. but. They, uh, last, last fall, the weather conditions were ideal, and especially in disturbed soils, these, these mushroom or these, these fungi really took off. And so one thing that you probably 
can maybe see a little bit, but this rind is super thick. Um, and it's thick enough that it can even uh, crack concrete. It may, even, it may even chip your lawnmower. So turf managers, people like Rock, really not a big fan of these guys. Um, if you're like me, they're, they're just something fun to look at in the yard. So I don't, I don't mind them near as much. But uh, they typically will be, they can be small, anywhere from two to about two to five inches. Typically the, um, they'll start off a little bit wider and then as they mature, the inside, which maybe we can see here, just becomes all powdery and just dusty. So we can see, there we go. We've got some dust flying up and, and there's my finger. And one of the really fun things is as they mature then too, the hole on the top splits open like a star. And so, beautiful, right, Kim? Uh, at one point, it probably was beautiful, Kyle. Um, big thing, though, <laughs> do not eat these. Um, again, do not eat them. They will not, not be very good for your tummy. So. Excellent, and you've made quite a mess. I have. All right, Elizabeth, um, what is that? Seeds! <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody has been chomping at the bit to get their seeds, and if you're like me, you've got quite a collection of seeds. Um, the first thing you need to do is you need to take a look at which ones can I plant early, which ones can I plant late. After you have those all sorted out, then you need to know, okay, this one I can direct seed into the ground, my turnips and my lettuce. Um, I can be putting my turnips in the ground right now. Um, so there's a differences in some of the packaging. Some of the packaging is more towards the commercial, uh, commercial end or towards the homeowner end. Um, so that's, you know, catchy picture, not catchy picture. But they still have all the same good information on the back of the seed packet. And so you need to make sure that you take a look at your seed packets to figure out how deep they need to go, how much spacing they need. And then also with some of them, um, we need to keep in mind that we will be starting them indoors. So usually you start about six to eight weeks prior to your first or last frost date. And it really depends on where you're at in the state, what that frost date is. I know for us in central Nebraska, we usually say Mother's Day. Um, so we usually give a buffer on top of that. So we're nearing that six to eight week window so I'll need to be starting my um, husk cherries here before long and my, I don't even know what I got, uh, straw flower, that was a free sample for me, um, before long because these need to be started indoors. Some of my other ones like um, my basil and some of my squash and cucumbers, those are all going to be direct seeded in the ground after Mother's Day. So once you get all your seeds, you need to take a look, sort them all out, decide what you need to plant right now, what you need to hold off on, and um, what you what you have. And wish you would have ordered seeds if you didn't or because they're <clears throat> probably gone. They're gonna be few and far between. So if you haven't got them yet and you have a favorite, go out and get it now. <laughs> exactly. All right, Jody. first questions go to you. So here we go. Um, this is a woman in Grand Island and she has six large old rose bushes. She's, she discovered the scale on them actually last fall. She's never had it before. They, they did have some Japanese beetles, imagine that, but she does want to know how, what to do when she does uncover them this spring. Is there anything that she can do with this? Yeah, so these are oyster shell scale. It's a type of hard scale, and it looks like, even though you only saw them last fall, that they've been around for probably a few seasons. What you need to do is wait for the crawler stage because that is the only susceptible stage that can um, be controlled. So you don't really want to do anything if you can't prune off any more of that. You may be able to take a, like something scrubby and soft to peel off the scales that are there. But basically you want to monitor for the crawler stage and then you can use horticultural oil to, to kill the crawlers. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty heavy bunch of oysters. Yeah, it's been there for a little longer than she thought probably. <laughs> All right, your next one, uh, this is actually a picture of the dreaded magnolia scale from last mm -hmm. year. Um, the question really came from Lincoln and Omaha and it's how to treat and when. Yeah, the magnolia scale has been getting, um, pr it's pretty common now, a lot of magnolia trees have them. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the time to treat again is the crawler stage and you know knowing what type of scale is very important. So we know the crawler stage for magnolia scale is going to be in the fall. I know uh, last year it was like third week of September that I 
saw a crawler. So at that stage is when you can treat and horticultural oil is gonna be what you can use. Two-sided tape is the best way to monitor for that, put that on the tree and check daily to see if there are crawlers. All right, and I'm not sure if we have another magnolia question, but we probably are gonna have one at some point in here. Oh, can I say for the oyster shell? Yeah. That one may be um, like May, so knowing that, start checking um, May. All right, for excellent. Colors. All right, Rock, you have four questions for your very first one here, and they are weeds, and this was sent in last week. So two different types of weeds, it looks like. They're showing up in the front lawn the past couple of weed weeks in areas where he did do a lot of patching with new topsoil and seed last fall. So that sort of sets the stage. He's tried we be gone, they wilt, they won't die, and, and they look like then they have a little single fat sturdy root. So I think we have one, two, three, four pictures on here that are showing what this might be, and there's sort of semi-dead, and then I think our final one here is the actual roots that are kind of squirrely, and he said, you know, they do kind of, they do this, and then they come back a little. Yes, it snaps to the, for sending that many images, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to identify everything you know, without a flower on it, you hear that on the show quite a bit. Uh, there's at least one or two winter annuals in here. Um, that are probably a member of the mustard family. There might be some shepherd's purse in there based on what, what we see on the screen. I, you know, I saw the distortion um, and obviously we, we see that there was some effect of the herbicide, but unfortunately these herbicides tend to work better at temperatures in excess of 55 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And we haven't seen that kind of weather. So it's, it's difficult to control weeds during the winter months or even spring and fall if we don't have those kind of elevated temperatures. And because of that, that's why they don't get the knockdown that they that they think they would. Uh, it's in a lawn, so certainly, you know, glyphosate will work or glyphosate containing products will work at a lower temperature, um, but it still isn't optimal. So they're not gonna, they shouldn't expect very good control. Being that these are probably winter annuals, or even if they're not, mowing is a great tool to get, take care of weeds. And you're gonna start to mow here in the next three to four weeks, depending on how well soil temperatures are. And then finally, you brought soil in. I'm not sure, they didn't mention where the soil came from, but fill dirt is often a great source of weed seed. So the, it could have been brought in, and it can be seeds, or it can be parts of a plant, of a perennial plant. And they did mention, there was one picture, it looked like I had a pretty healthy taproot on it. But some of our winter annuals can grow a pretty healthy tap just from the spring germination. So I can't really key it down to species. I'm gonna say you can probably mow most of those out. And then when it gets warmer, certainly if they behave more like a perennial than later this spring, um, you could probably hit it with any of the herbicides, but be careful in the spring applications of herbicides because we've got other sensitive plants that are just leafing out as well as tomatoes in the garden and, and grapes and other things. So really you may just be mowing it and then wait until fall where we have less injury and non-target injury to um, other plants. Now yeah, that's great, and the soil thing can really be an issue with those darn. More seedlings. often than not, it's it's yeah. probably the driving force behind why they went from very few weeds to a right. virtual cornucopia of weeds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Kyle, uh, you've got several pictures on this one. This is from Bellevue, mm -hmm. and it's a white pine. So uh, he he gave us a lot of background. It was planted about six years ago, six feet tall, looked great. Uh, it's now 18 to 20 feet tall fully exposed to sun and wind, underground irrigation system. He did deep water a couple of times, and then he found this, he's calling it a, a, a west spot, where it broke and then found this another spot, and he's wondering what this is, and you can bat it either way, because it's a little, always a little hard to tell on these. Yeah, uh, so there are, there are a few different things that can kind of cause that white pitch on, on pines or, or a, lot of con a lot of our conifers. One of them is Cytospora canker, and it's one of the characteristic symptoms of Cytospora canker is the uh, is that white that white ooze that kind of comes out. Uh, Cytospora is favored by drought by trees that are drought stressed, which we certainly had this past year. It's great to hear that you have been watering them, but with the amount of resin that was on there, I was actually wondering if there's not Zimmerman pine moth that's going on there. Um, yeah, that's what it looks like. It's usually that popcorn, soft, mushy stuff, and that's mm -hmm. what it looks like it's dripping out. So that is made by a caterpillar. And so for that Zimmerman pine moth, you'd wanna treat in April. So coming now. up now, <laughs> um, and then 
again in August, because those are the only two times that you, the caterpillar will be susceptible or that the moth will be emerging in laying eggs. So those two times for Zimmerman pine moth. All right, thanks, Jody. And I think you have a couple more that are also pines. Uh, yeah. These are, let's see. He says, wilting white pine started to get brown earlier in the winter. It was vibrant, and that can bat the other way if it needs to. Yep. So we had <laughs> talked about how, how dry things were. Um, I think that this, uh, this pine is probably not too long for this world um, with the, the amount of wilting that's occurring and the, the, death from the, the death from the inside out is really not, really not good. Um, there are a few different diseases, diseases that can cause um, the internal needles to, to die, so, so, such as dothostroma or brown spot, but I think that this is primarily a water issue um, and the tree is most likely um, should be pruned at ground level. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. All right, Elizabeth, your first ones. Welcome back, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these pictures actually uh, are of tomatoes and in containers. So she sent us two pictures of the plants and one of the media. She did cut back water, move the lights a little. She said they look better, but you want to talk a little bit about the media you should use and how you water so, uh, these particular plants. Yeah, yeah, when we're first starting to put in our, um, our tomatoes and when we start in seeds, we want to use a light seed starting mix. We don't want to use anything too heavy. And so what we are seeing is this might be a little bit heavy for a seed starting mix. On top of that, if you look really closely at some of those pictures, we're seeing some algae growth and we're seeing that green color on top. That's mm -hmm. usually an indication that they've been kept way too wet. And mm -hmm. so by cutting that watering back, that's gonna help out. I drop the lights down lower um, and make sure that you leave enough room in there so they're not cooking the plants. But if you give them too much room, the plants are gonna start to stretch and you're gonna have tall leggy tomatoes. So drop that light down, that's gonna help out quite a bit too. All right, thanks Elizabeth. And you have one more, which has nothing to do with tomatoes and this came to us uh, from fall when it grows and blooms in the spring it's lovely then it falls flops and this is actually one of the sedums so so a lot of our um, plants that really don't require a lot of moisture, if they get too much moisture, they start to lodge or they start to flop. And right. so sedums is one of those that doesn't require a lot of moisture. It looks like it's near kind of an edge or near an irrigated area, so it's probably getting more water than what it needs. And so what's happening is, is as it go grows throughout the season, it gets too much water and then it just flops open. So cut back on the water and you won't have that issue. All right, thanks Elizabeth. You know, 70 years ago, our program began on a television station here in Lincoln. Over the years, we've been privileged to help you with your lawns, your gardens, and those home landscapes. And we have prepared a special welcome for you tonight as we celebrate a birthday milestone. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another session of the Backyard Farmer. It looks like another busy one hour here in the backyard, so if you would like to telephone your questions about your yards, your trees, your shrubs, your ornamentals, plant diseases, insects, and what have you, why dial Hemlock 27631 and ask for the Backyard Farmer. That's Hemlock 27631. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first color visit here on Backyard Farmer. And tonight we're celebrating the Backyard Farmer's 20th year on television and the dedication of the new Nebraska Telecommunications Center. Well, hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. Tonight we're live at the Nebraska State Fair. Hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Peggy Lowe, filling in for regular host Jim Randall. Good evening everyone and welcome to another edition of Backyard Farmer. I'm your host Reggie Carlson. Hello and welcome to another edition of Backyard Farmer. I'm John Fesch and we're glad that you could join 1953, 70 years ago. Can you imagine what it must have been like to try to figure out how to create a live television show in this venerable old temple building at a time when television had just barely been invented? There was no such thing as digital media, digital cameras, social media. It was just a great idea on the part of the Land Grant University to answer all of those questions from an audience about landscapes, lawns, pests and diseases, and do it on live television.
Capitol is surely the most beautiful building in the entire state of Nebraska, and of course it is the people's building. So all the richness of history, all 93 counties, which are represented in the building itself, and all of the interesting history and the richness of humanity tied to the land. Backyard Farmer has the same reach, all 93 counties and beyond, and we go as wide and far with that science-based information as the capital is high. So we just enjoy bringing to you everything that makes your garden grow, makes your life so much more interesting in the state of Nebraska. One of our best creations is our Backyard Farmer garden. It's a little over a decade old now, and we've been able to demonstrate all of those best practices, show you what we do wrong so you don't have to, let you enjoy all those pests and critters and the beautiful plants, because we are open all the time, 365, 24 seven. You get to come stroll, enjoy, look at whether spring has sprung, and decide what you would like to take home yourself. The best things in life are family and friends and all those partners, whether it's plants and people, or somebody like our Nebraska Public Media partner. The show is what it is because we work so well together, and we work really hard. We've lasted 70 years because of all that hard work. We are ready to start the season again. We want you to come on in and enjoy it with us. Happy birthday to us. That was fun to see all those former hosts. We're proud to carry on the tradition and let's answer some questions. Jodester, Okay. here we go. I'm ready. So this is from <laughs> Omaha. Uh, this is, he thinks this is a seed clinging to the bald cypress, but he's uncertain and I thought it was a, some sort of a weird insect thing. It's a seed. It's a seed. <laughs> it looks like a milkweed <laughs> seed. <laughs> and how about this one? This, we've seen lots of these. Yep. This came from Beaver Crossing and he had a whole bunch of them. Yep, so that is an egg case, or uthika, of a Chinese praying mantis. So good guys in there, kind of, yeah. Yep. So then we have one that comes to us from Hall County, Elizabeth, uh, found this on an elderberry stem. This is actually uh, gonna be an amazing moth. This is a Cecropia moth uh, cocoon. It's our largest moth in North America. Oh my goodness, that's yeah. fabulous. All right, thanks Jody. Rock, this is an Omaha viewer that has a big red maple, they think, on a slope that faces southeast. It's not irrigated. There are these roots everywhere. The grass is between them, thin, really brown, wants the turf. <laughs> so, so they desire turf where, we, where, where it won't grow? Right. Uh, okay, so <laughs> just, just to make sure I'm clear on that, uh, if, if you want to try gr to grow grass under trees, you're going to struggle whether they have shallow roots or not. And some of our tree species are shallow rooted, and so they're gonna be up at the surface. And I can see some damage on these roots from the mower, so it, so it looks to me like they, they are banging up the roots a little bit, which isn't good for the tree. Plus, you're in an area that's really hostile to grass growth. Our suggestion is and always will be to mulch up underneath those trees and, and either plant some you know, flowering perennials that, that are shade tolerant or, or nothing at all and just mulch them up so that you don't have that competition between uh, the turf and the tree and you don't damage or potentially get too close with the mower or the string trimmer as you try to trim that grass around it. That may not be what the consumer wants to hear or the homeowner wants to hear and I apologize because I can't really in good conscience make a recommendation to try to, try to grow grass underneath a tree and potentially damage the tree and not have grass that grows very well. All right, your next one is um, a Lincoln viewer, strip between curb and sidewalk, looked like this before the rain, still does. So why is it green along the edges and brown in the middle? That's the heat island effect, You're, you know, that we mentioned it earlier in the show with, with the thermometer as our sample, right? Um, you know, right against the, the street and right against the sidewalk is where temperatures are gonna green up faster. And we've been a very slow temperature rise this, this spring. So it's happening very gradually. At some point in time, probably in the next three to four weeks, assuming that turf wasn't winter killed, then you should see in a uniform green up. It's just gonna take a little bit, a little bit longer and just be patient with that. It should, it should turn the corner here in the not too distant future when ambient and soil temperatures warm up. All right, excellent. Kyle, uh, these pictures came to us um, from Facebook, but we've seen this all over the place. What is this and what should be done with it? I think you have a couple here. Yeah, so this, this is black knot. Um, 
pretty common on a lot of a lot of our prunus um, species. You see it a lot uh, often on often on plums um, as well. As far as control, um, the best thing to do is really to prune it out. And this is a great time um, before, the, especially with the, this, this, this delayed spring that we're having, you can still do some pruning. Um, and so as we, can, as we see those big galls on the branches, eventually they will girdle the branch and kill, the, kill everything past it. But make sure to cut those, um, cut those branches out. Make sure you're, that you're cutting at least three to four inches down past where, the, where you're seeing those galls. And that's really the best way to control um, black knot in a in a most homeowner situations. Fungicides typically are not recommended unless it's a commercial application. All right, and your next two have to do with the dreaded cedar apple rust. They wonder if this is cedar apple rust. That is <laughs> that is worse than cedar apple rust. That is pollen, <laughs> and that is the reason that my eyes have been watering and my nose has been <laughs> stuffed up. And yep, so that's the that is a male a, a male tree and it's just full of pollen. All right, and then this Paxton viewer has purchased this product and wants to know whether it's effective for CAR. It is not. Um, so most of the, and so um, the, can't, can't see it too terribly well in this picture, but the active ingredient, or the fungicide active ingredient in this product is carbaryl, and that is not, that's effective against apple scab, not rust. If you are thinking about um, cedar apple rust, you'll want a product that, can, um, that contains um, uh, propiconazole, or, um, or uh, yeah, but for the most part, <laughs> cedar apple rust does not need to be controlled. It's, there will be spots on your trees, but the tree will survive. And there may drop a few leaves, but cedar apple rust really is not something that we need to be controlling a whole lot. Just learn to live with it, enjoy those spray painted app, um, flowering crabs in the fall. All right, Elizabeth, uh, this is a uh, hydrangea pruning question. First off, this comes to us from Carney. A couple of questions, and this is uh, fire. She's calling it fire. So prune now or later? You know, wait for those buds to swell before we prune. It's been a super hard, super dry winter, and you want to make sure that we've got some growth or we're going to have to replace um, with those. All right, and your next two are actually uh, hydrangeas planted. There's the house, and then the, the pictures of the the ones doing poorly and the ones doing well, and they are macrophylla. So the problem with the macrophylla, those are like the endless summer ones that, you know, pink or blue, depending on your pH. They're not reliably hardy for us, and they usually bloom on second year wood, so they're not gonna be extremely happy in that location. I know they had two batches, one was doing good, one wasn't. Um, we might take a look at that second site where they weren't doing so well, and Start do a soil it. sample, check it out, maybe try something different other than that uh, type of hydrangea. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. You know, another tradition here on Backyard Farmer is our weekly garden update. You might think things are a little bit dreary this time of year. We're already starting to see some of those spring flowers pop out of the ground. Here's Terry James to tell us more. We are so excited to be out here in the Backyard Farmer Garden for our 70th season. We are so excited to be showing you what's been happening in the garden since we left you last September. As you know, we got all of our beds ready to go to bed for the winter. Everything worked really well. Didn't get as much moisture as we really wanted to, but things are really starting to pop in the garden. We have all of our little spring flowers coming up, our prairie smoke, our prairie willow, and we have some great pansies already planted out in the garden. We are also starting to get our raised beds up and ready to go. We have some seeds starting. We are waiting for those to emerge out of the ground. But we've been really busy in the greenhouse. Since January, we've been growing plants, getting them ready to be planted out in the backyard farmer garden in May. So stop by the backyard farmer garden and check it out. Right now, it is time for lightning. All right, Elizabeth, you're up. You haven't done this for a while. I know, I'm, I'm a little rusty. You don't get to pass on all of Duh. that. So this is, a, this is a viewer who wants to know whether you can grow perennial peanut grass in Nebraska. I don't even know what that is, so no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm with you. So in the sand hills, so this is Purdom, Nebraska, this viewer wants to uh, know how to grow hops and which hops we would recommend or who could recommend the variety. 
there were some hop trials out in Scott's Bluff. And so I would talk to the research center out there or on campus, um, we do have a hops breeder and a hops program and start there. All right, we have a Pierce, Nebraska viewer who uh, wants to know they're gr they've grown strawberries. Should they go ahead and take off all those dead leaves or just leave them be for mulch? <sighs> yes. I don't, you know, take it away a little bit, knowing that we live in Nebraska, you might have to cover them back up. All right. This is a Carney viewer who has an old apple they love and wants to know, is there any way to determine the type of apple? Um, no. <laughs> You're exactly right on that. <laughs> nice job. Okay, Kyle, you are up next, unless you want the turf questions. I'll, I'll take whatever. Okay, all right, we'll mix it up. So uh, we got this question from two or three viewers this year, and it is, um, they had powdery mildew on their nine bark last year terribly. This is Omaha. They wanna know what they can do now to keep that from happening again. Prune, um, anything you can do to increase airflow will decrease powdery mildew. All right, um, this is a viewer in Lincoln who has a great big dead sort of mushroom looking thing at the base of a tree between sidewalk and curb. They're wondering, will that turn into anything? Should they, what should they do about the great dead? I would just keep an eye on the tree. If it's showing other signs of decline, um, then start, start to worry about it. But if it is just a, just a dead mushroom, um, may, maybe something and maybe not, hard to tell. All right, uh, another powdery mildew question. This one is a viewer who had powdery mildew on their peonies terribly last year, wants to know what to do about it this year. Again, um, anything you can do to increase airflow, decrease wetness. And the first of the pear rust questions has come in. Is it time to treat for the pear rust? Once, uh, treat, for, treat when the <laughs> buds are beginning to, to break and then every seven to 10 days, as long as we have wet conditions. All right, which we need. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now it's your turn, Rock, with turfage. So um, you have lots of pre questions still. I'm still going to ask them. This is an Axtell viewer who uh, has like a prairie site right next door, and it's been dry, and they're wondering whether they should go ahead and pre anyway, even though it's been dry. Um, it's still a little bit early to pre, but if they want to put a pre down, I would wait a little bit longer than now because soil temperatures aren't up yet. All right, this is a Bradshaw viewer who wants to know about timing for putting preen in flower beds. Flower beds tend to warm up quicker, so we're probably, if you want a calendar date, uh, mid to late April, um, but if you want a soil temperature, once again, it's about 50 to 55 degrees for consecutive days if you're gonna take soil temperatures or use the CropWatch website to get those numbers. All right. We also have somebody who wants to control crabgrass in Carl Forster feather reed grass without killing the Carl Forster. Well, Carl Forster is a perennial and it's gonna come up fine with any of the pre-emergence, landscape pre-emergence, preen will work, as well as some of the pendimethalin based products. All right, we have several people asking whether it is too early to seed their lawns or overseed. Um, it's probably too early. They need to wait a little bit longer, but if you put the seed down now, as long as you don't leave it on the surface where the birds can get to it, certainly the opportunity for uh, that to germinate when conditions are right is fine. We don't recommend spring seeding. We'd rather see it seeded in the fall. Excellent, nice job. All right, Jody. Here we go. Okay. This is a viewer who wants to know, is there anything you can use on a turf for grubs that won't hurt the birds? I have a minute. <laughs> this is the line you're in question? <laughs> Just say no. How I have no know? idea. No, I don't know. <laughs> this is a Morse Bluff, uh, kind of that area viewer who cut down a tree and they found EAB in it and they're wondering how long the, the little beetles can live in the fallen tree. They found EAB, mm -hmm. uh, so they should probably mulch that up. Okay, all right. Yeah. They're wondering also, um, will they stay alive in a board for a long time if the tree's already cut down? No, they won't stay alive in the board, but they will in the firewood. It'll take time for them to emerge. All right, uh, this is a viewer who wants to know whether there's anything they can put down to keep ants away under landscape fabric outside. I, there's not really, that's not economical, no. And carpenter ants, how do we treat them now before they cause trouble again? 
Well, it depends where they are. These are all really hard questions. <laughs> and they're really real questions. So our viewers are sending right, us some really fabulous <laughs> questions. So can we go back to the, the grub one? Just? In a minute, we got to do plants of the week. Oh, and sorry. then you can answer that one later. Just cool your jets. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, plants of the week. So we have some really fun plants of the week this week. Um, we'll just start with the spiky, fun looking ones. This is the prairie willow. And so the prairie willow is native and it is in flower right now, um, as are many of our early flowering um, ones in this family. This one likes that full sun. The great thing about this is it's four to six feet. So we're not talking an extremely large willow. It's gonna be one of the smaller ones. Um, it likes it dry and it does attract those early pollinators. Now the other one that we have in here, it doesn't look like much, I'll just give it that, um, but when you see it as a real plant out in the backyard farmer garden, you will fall in love with this one because this one is prairie smoke. Um, it's an early bloomer. Yes, these are the blooms, but the reason you grow it is not for the blooms. You grow it for the seed heads that follow because it's called prairie smoke for a reason. It has these really fun, smoky looking um, seed heads that have this long little kite type thing on them. Um, it's really fun to look at, but this one does like it well drained because it is one of our natives. Um, so these are two very nice um, plants of the week that came out of the backyard farmer garden. Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, Jody. <laughs> Questions? Okay. So this one is mystery substance on pine. Gray substance on an older pine in the backyard. They thought it looked like paint. However, the angle's wrong. So you want to toss this a different way? Yeah. Or what do you think this is? Okay, so this looks like sap. Mm -hmm. Probably yeah. from stress from a tree that mm -hmm. Kyle might know about. Eas easily could be. Um, this looks a lot more like Cytospora canker to me. Um, and again, with cankers, not a whole lot to do aside from decreasing other stresses on the tree. So make sure that we're watering it well enough and doing everything else that we can to keep the tree healthy. All right. Uh, Another magnolia question. Okay. This, this is kind of a stumper. It's a 40 year old tree, so it's beginning to shed bark. This is the Benson neighborhood in Omaha. I'm wondering what these odd marks are. And then it kind of looks like there's a little boar, but this is also the south side of the house and it's an old tree. Yeah, it is likely some kind of wood borer. I don't know which kind it is. There's not a, a borer specific to magnolia, but if it's a really stressed old tree, it could be a number of the wood boring beetles that will attack right. unhealthy trees. Okay, so Rock, your first one here is, um, there's a retaining wall separating the backyard from the sidewalk. The lawn is between the wall and the house. Little weeds with blue flowers. They're everywhere. What are they? Uh, this is a, the genus is Veronica. It's speedwell, winter annual. It seeds earlier than most of the plants. Um, actually better to control it in the fall with a pre-emergent because right now it's going to die as soon as we get warm, which is going to happen hopefully sooner rather than later. But there's really not much you can do right now and get effective control. All right. And your next one is a Fremont viewer. These weeds came up and then grew like weeds. They're in mulch beds. They want to know what they are or, more importantly, how to control them before they spread into the yard. Okay, the one on the yeah. left is catnip, um, but just they go, make cats go crazy, um, mint family. And you see it actually all over throughout this picture. The one on the right, I'm not really sure of, um, but if they're wanting to control it in a landscape bed, certainly a, glyph a targeted glyphosate application would knock it back. Um, the catnip does come back year after year, so you probably want to hit it once or twice before it gets away from them anymore. And once catnip gets into the lawn, it's very difficult to control. All right, thank you, Rock. Okay, Kyle, uh, this is a Norfolk viewer. Cherry tree, uh, tart cherries, but all these places have cracks in the joints and the sticky stuff uh, is what, 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 what? Yeah, here? so it's, yeah. it's some sort of bacterial canker. Um, yeah. there, there's two of them that really hit cherries. One is, one is caused by, by a Pseudomonas syringae. The other is the dreaded fire blight. So if you are seeing those um, fire blight symptoms, so it's basically you're seeing the uh, blackened, um, blackened branches and pe petioles and the shepherd's crook, it's most likely fire blight. Otherwise, it's this bacterial canker. Not a whole lot to do um, about it aside from, aside from pruning. <laughs> At the base. At the base, yeah. All right, and then we have a viewer in Lincoln who has a plum about 10 years old showing this on the trunk. 
Bacteria, <laughs> some sort of bacterial canker, either Pseudomonas syringae or the um, or fire blight. Same, so, same and thing. Same, same thing. Same yep. thing. It's, yeah. All righty. Elizabeth, this comes to us from Sydney, um, creating a native flower garden in an urban setting. She wants to use it for a good purpose along a city walking path. Native flowers pollinator gardens. So. Any ideas on where they can go for some advice on pollinator gardens? So um, UNL has some really great resources on their website. And there's also a great um, group that I found out about called the Nebraska Native Seed and Plant Producers. And there's a lot of different entities as a part of this. And um, some of my favorites are in there. And I know I can't name them. So check out that website. <laughs> and they've got lots of great resources on there. Um, as well as the Nebraska State Wide Arboretum also has some great uh, native plants too. So there's some great resources. Great, excellent. The first of our boxwood shrubs, uh, winter kill in 2021, they weren't pruned. Now they want to trim the dead out. Can they do that now and give it a hope? You know, prune the dead out and if you don't like the way it looks, you can always remove it and replace it. But yep, take the dead whenever you get a chance. All right, excellent. You know, in many parts of the state, this winter was brutally dry. That has had an effect on our agricultural crops and of course our home landscapes. Trees, shrubs, and turf can really be desiccated during the winter months or severely damaged. So here's Todd Fowler from Fowler Landscape in York to tell us about how to get those plants going this spring with a drink. Depending on where you're at in the state, I have found uh, soil, soil not to be as bad as we think it is. Before the rains we got the last couple times, and we, we got in on two rains, uh, we had a really good soaking rain in November and a little bit in December, very little. But we found, I've had guys tell me that they're trenching wire into irrigation systems before this rain and it was mud underneath. Granted, that was under a, a pivot all year. Uh, we have found digging in our own pasture that there was moisture underneath, even though the top was really dry. So I know it's been a dry winter. Uh, we look outside, it looks bone dry with the grass on top, but underneath uh, we've been surprised to actually find some moisture before these rains. Granted, if you're in a sandy soil, I'd say it probably was another story. So depending on the soil type, that can be a factor. Uh, we have also noticed on evergreen plants in particular, those are the ones taking the brunt of the drought. For instance, uh, evergreen trees like white pine, uh, perennials like ajuga, uh, coral bells, we've seen a lot of burn on those, ajuga in particular. I don't know if some plantings aren't altogether dead that, that we've seen. So what do you do in those cases? No matter how much you would have watered during the winter, it was all wind that was desiccating them. So it wasn't something you did or didn't do. Um, just in Nebraska, we just have some evergreen plants in general that can suffer in years like this. Okay, for spring, where do we go from here? Uh, if you have sandier soil, no mulch on top. Uh, I suggest putting mulch down around plants, number one, especially new plantings to retain moisture. Might have to water a little bit if you've been missing on some of the rains or the snows, the few snow that we've had. Uh, clay soils um, really isn't that bad. I, I'd say again, mulch is gonna be a factor. Heavier soils are holding the moisture really well. I'd be careful not to overwater either because again, heavier soils are holding that moisture. So thing I like to do is make sure new plantings are mulched. Some of the older plantings, if, if the ground is cracked and, and seems to be drying out, maybe put a, a layer of mulch and water as needed. If you do get a chance, it's really important to survey and look at what's going on in your yard, all that winter damage and anything that really does need additional watering. Hopefully mother nature will help us a little bit too, but <laughs> cross your fingers on that one. All right. Jody, last round. This is Bennington. Um, and is there some sort of soil treatment around for Japanese beetles multiplied last year? And you actually have a couple questions. Is there pre-treatment, grub control? 
Okay, so that's like an hour presentation, <laughs> but so these are not happening right now because we don't even have any blooms. This right. will be happening, these adult Japanese beetles will be out probably, I don't know, third week of June. Mm -hmm. The first question was about Pre soil treatment. or soil drench. So yeah. the reason why it's complicated is because these have a complete life cycle where their larvae are turf pests and their adult are everything else pests above ground. And that 10 months of the year, they're under the ground. So mm -hmm. it depends where the problem is. If the problem is on the plants above ground, if you're treating the soil, it could be a waste of product and it's not an issue. So if you wanna treat the soil for something on top, you have to make sure you have like a grub problem. So you wanna um, scout and make sure there's what, like, I don't know, ten eight to 10? Yeah. It, then you would treat yeah. the turf. But if you're worried about the plants above ground, then, um, I mean, there's a, it depends what the plant is. So if it's an ornamental that can be treated, it's on the label, you can do a systemic, like for roses, um, and then it's gotta be in the ground enough time that it can translocate to the plant. All right, excellent. So, uh, Rock, this is a viewer in Eagle on a corner lot. Buffalo grass lawn's about 10 years old, doesn't irrigate or do anything else, but these weeds in these two pictures come in really strong. And the second picture is an area he killed, tilled, and plugged. Plugged look great, but now this has happened. How to control weeds in buffalo grass? Uh, there's a lot of weeds going on here, and, and buffalo grass, some people like to spray Roundup in the fall. They used to spray it in the spring, but we got a lot of delay in greenup, and as well as some death of the buffalo grass. So wait till it's fully green. I uh, use a non 24 d containing broadleaf product, um, and uh, it's an unirrigated site, so you know they're gonna be able to tolerate some weeds from some, and, and knock them back with that, or, or um, just let it grow a little bit taller, and mow off the seed heads to keep it back and you could probably abate them that way as well. But there's multiple ways, but right now is not the time to treat because you'll delay green up, um, even if it's not a glyphosate product. So there, you can get these controlled. It's just gonna be a little bit of a lifelong ambition. <laughs> Facetiously, it, it's gonna be at least a year or two unless you just go after them so aggressively with herbicides. But once again, we don't recommend a lot of herbicide application except for pre-emergent in the spring because of potential damage to sensitive ornamentals and pollinators and everything else that out there that's not turf. All right, excellent, thanks Rock. And, and your next one here is, this is a Lincoln viewer. This circle is where a tree was removed a couple years ago. The owner brought in soil, plugged in some turf in the center. It was watered, it didn't really spread much. You can kind of see the, the little lumps where it was. Um, the whole lawn was treated with something that turned it sort of blue and all the weedy grasses turned bluey white. What in the world was that treated with and did it work? Uh, well, it, it appears that it didn't really work very well because once again, it, temperatures were probably too low. I'm thinking they put a blue marker dye. I don't know of a herbicide that's blue. I know some that turn weeds white. The, uh, um, the Tenacity product or, or Mesotrion turns weeds white. So I think that was a marker dye they put in there for some reason. And the reason it's so much greener right there around where that soil was aerated is because it has more air and hence the turf was healthier there. But th that was an interestingly um, weird blue color. That's for sure. All right, thanks, Rock. All right, this is Ernians in Columbus, Kyle, and she actually sent us these pictures uh, because this happened second year in a row. They rotted in the ground, spoiled, slimy layer, nasty smell, half rotted in the ground. Others rotted while they were hanging to dry, and she doesn't want this to happen again. So what does she do? The best thing to do is plant onions in a different place, and so it not entirely sure what is, what, is, what is causing this. Typically with a, with a basil rot like we have here, that's um, fusarium is the main, the main thing. However, she also mentioned that they were slimy and they smelled bad. That's indicative of, a, of, of some sort of bacterial soft rot. Bacterial soft rots typically come in from the top though. So not, it's one of those things, but Best thing to do, plant onions in a different place, um, rotate away from, from where you are, and hopefully this year you'll have a better crop. And you know, they don't smell quite as bad as rotten potatoes, but it's pretty darn close. It's nasty. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, um, this is a papillion viewer. This is a house plant question. Two pictures of this one. Uh, what is it and how do we take care of it? 
So this is a really fun house plant. It's a peperomia, um, and it's called the green bean or happy bean um, is what it is. And so this is a house plant that's fairly easy to keep alive. Um, it really likes the bright filtered light, so not in direct light, and it likes average um, moisture. So let it dry out in between waterings, but it is a super easy plant to keep alive and try. I have one and I don't do houseplants. <laughs> <laughs> and what's this one? Uh, this is, he just asked what this is. This is Lincoln. So that is Hedra Helix and it is Plasticus, which means it's a faux ivy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not real. Yeah. That, that one was a little bit of a, uh, yeah, we could figure that one out mm -hmm. that that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> there is a variegated one, but it's not that shiny. Not that nice. <laughs> Okay, so Rock, let's come back. You wanted to fill in on the grub question, and, and it's great to do it because it's... Yeah, and there was a little bit of a stumper. Poor Jody had to start her <laughs> speed round with that question, and it was a little bit hard. But I think what they're referring to is that they want to know about bird safety and grub mm -hmm. products. And most of the more contemporary um, grub products are not harmful to birds. The old diazinon product that had a little granule that looked like seed mm -hmm. or something was often consumed by waterfowl and other things and that's one of the reasons it was pulled off the market for domestic or home lawn use and so but if you look at something that contains the celeprin or the merit based products i forget what the active and merit is thank you i couldn't say that so <laughs> i appreciate that both of those are safe for birds and plus you water them in um so i don't I think there was an answer to that question although it started off a little bit weird well i just thought i was going to get in trouble because you know, we're supposed to be killing grubs, not birds. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and interestingly enough, I mean, I, if I were to think back, oh, these many years on the things that I used. Oh, exactly. Diazinon. Let's just go down the list. Well, Chlorindane is an insecticide and a pre-emergent herbicide that we used to put down at 20 oh, pounds oh, oh, per I, acre. I, I know. Yeah. It's... I know. I know. All right. So, Jody, <laughs> we oh. do have questions because we have a little bit of time. Uh, this is a brown marmorated stink bug mm -hmm. question because we had apparently a lot of people, we got these questions over the winter, mm -hmm. what to do about brown marmorated stink bugs, mostly in the house. Yeah, so they're yeah. fall invaders. They overwinter in the house. They don't reproduce or cause any problems except be there. But anytime there was a sunny day, it warmed up the voids or the attic and then they started coming out of the woodwork. So they were already in there. We don't recommend insecticide inside the house. Yeah. Just so sweep them up. Do they do a lot of damage? I mean, that no, idea. they don't do any damage. They're just a nuisance, and they are going to try to get out in the spring, whenever spring actually starts happening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rock, you get one more on this round since you're next in in line. So this is the aerating question. People have aerated. Do they? And you answered yes. You can see. Do they need to rake those cores in after they've done that, or can they just let Mother Nature do her? Thing on Kim, those. that's a great suggestion. Let the soil fall back into the hole. That hole's really nice and full of air, and the seed germinates and it does really well. Then it's protected from the mower if it's an overseeding. So, you know, it grows a little bit before the mower hacks it off and pulls it out of the ground. So that's an excellent suggestion is to break up those cores, drag them back into the holes. All right, excellent. And Kyle, one more powdery mildew question. Awesome. <laughs> Which is we always get this one in the turf. Mm -hmm. Anything that can be done, because you can't really open up unless you not not a whole deal. lot typically powdery mildew in turf is an indication that that's not a spot that you should maybe have turf um, or anything so if, if you make if you can do pruning of other other plants to increase more sunlight in the area that will decrease the powdery mildew but in general powdery mildew is not a big problem it's just a thing